Investigations of the January 6th Capitol attack are still underway. But as husband and wife reporting team Peter Baker of the New York Times and Susan Glasser of the New Yorker explain in their latest book, to understand what happened on January 6, 2021, it is necessary to understand what happened on January 20th, 2017, the day President Donald Trump took office and all the days in between. And that is a focus of their book, The Divider, which is out this week. And we welcome you both, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, to the News Hour. So this is an eye-popping book, literally from the first page, when you lay out your premise that that January 6th attack, and I'm quoting, was the inexorable culmination of a sustained four-year war on the institutions and traditions of American democracy. Peter, that is a stunning statement about the president of the United States. Yeah, no, it really is. But that's the, that's the case here. January 6th was not an aberration. It wasn't an outlier. It was, in fact, you know, predictable, eminently, if you pay attention to everything he was doing up until that point. He tried to turn the institutions of American government to, to, into his personal political instruments, the Justice Department, the military, and all of these uh, uh, efforts basically lead up to this moment where he's refusing to accept the democratic election in which he lost. And I think to understand that, we have to understand what he was doing for four years. Nobody else has gone back to take that look. Susan, there's so much to ask you all, but, but a, a lot of the book is about the division between the people who were around Trump, the people who were, in essence, uh, trying to protect the country and worried about the country, and then, and then there were others who were enabling him. It, what's, a, what's a good example of one of those who was worried more about the country than they were about President Trump? Well, you're right. And the complication, of course, Judy, is in, in that faction-ridden White House, the enablers sometimes were also the resistors. Uh, but then again, the enablers were also the people who facilitated Trump. Without them, Donald Trump would have just been some, you know, angry old dude shouting at the television in between golf games, right? But, uh, you know, there was a group in particular of national national security officials uh, who defined their roles as protecting the nonpartisan traditions of national security. And this is a through line that goes back to the very beginning of the Trump administration. He called people like Jim Mattis and John Kelly my generals. He had clashes with them. He extraordinarily told John Kelly, his second White House chief of staff, uh, you know, why aren't you like the bleeping uh, Nazi generals in World War II? Kelly said, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, you know, he said, you know, they were totally loyal to Hitler. Kelly said, no, no, they weren't. You know, they tried to kill Hitler three times. But Donald Trump defined service to the country as service to him personally. And so you go forward to 2020 and his clash with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley. And for me as a reporter, getting a hold of a copy of Milley's unsent resignation letter in which he called the president of the United States a danger, a threat to national security. He said, you're doing grave and irreparable harm to the country. I, it's still mind blowing. Was there one point, Susan, when you felt the country came closest to coming off the rail? We're clearly and rightly focused on January the 6th, but there were other moments as well. Well, that's that's exactly right, Judy. I mean, you know, all of 2020 in many ways was, you know, a, a catastrophic year for this country. Uh, the the manipulation of a public health crisis, a once in a century pandemic, uh, you know, to exacerbate the divisions within American society, to turn something like a piece of cloth worn over the face as a public health measure into a, a badge, a partisan affiliation. This is a terrible tragedy for the American people, no matter where they, they live, right? And then I think the, the testing of institutions that we wrote about that existed throughout, uh, you know, Donald Trump seriously considered in a five-hour meeting in the White House after he lost re-election, imposing martial law. He didn't throw the people out of the Oval Office and say, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, in December 2021, he spent hours contemplating unprecedented steps. And as it is, we faced a situation that has never before happened in American history in which a president of the United States refused to accept his defeat and sought to overturn the election. That's, that's never happened before. No Democrat, no Republican, no president, period. Did you come away thinking uh, that if, 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 if these, some of these individuals around the president had been more uh, 
just had more courage mm. in standing up to him that things could have been different or, or that no matter what, Donald Trump was going to do what he did? Well, that's a great question. And one of the through lines we found in our research, again, we did all this interview after he left office. We didn't hold anything back while he was in office, but we interviewed 300 people and they were freer to talk or felt freer to talk after he left. And the through line through this was the struggle that many of them felt, this sort of moral conundrum. Do I stay or do I go? Those who weren't true believers. And they told themselves, a lot of them, the same thing over and over again. If I leave, it will be worse because somebody behind me who comes and takes my job will be more willing to do whatever, whatever. extreme thing he wants us to do that I'm trying to stop. And you can see the difference in January 6th. Think about John Kelly, right? You know, not to, everybody in some ways is flawed in that White House, as somebody told us who was in that White House says there are no heroes. But if John Kelly had been chief of staff at the end, he would have thrown himself in the doorway of the Oval Office rather than let somebody come in and talk about martial law. Whereas Mark Meadows was called by one of the Republicans we interviewed, the matador, because he kept waving the flag and basically encouraging this whole effort. And I think that people do matter uh, and people around him mattered, even if they weren't going to change his fundamental nature. Sure. You, you do come away from, from so much of this, Peter, of course, looking at uh, if Donald Trump runs for re-election, what is the country facing? Did you yeah. come to a conclusion? Yeah, this book is not just a book of history, right? It is, in fact, partly uh, a prologue, it could be, if he runs again. And in some ways, it is a roadmap for where he would go. And I, we interviewed a national security advisor, not the national security advisor, a national security official who spent time with him in the Oval Office. And this person compared him to the velociraptor in the movie Jurassic Park, which is to say that he learns, right? Not, not about policy. He's not really a policy maker. He learns how to make government work for him after four years in office. And this person compared him to the velociraptor who learns how to open the kitchen door where the, to, where the, the kids movie. are hiding mm -hmm. in the movie, right? He's learning how to do it. And the point is that in a second term, a lot of things that held him back, that constrained him in the first term, wouldn't be there. He wouldn't hire a John Kelly. He'd only hire a Mark Meadows. He wouldn't uh, uh, be uh, captive to the people who were slow walking him or resisting him. He would be much more aggressive and certain of his own ability. And he wouldn't have a reelection to worry about, to think about he could do what he thought uh, was the right thing or the thing he wanted to do most without uh, being constrained. And finally, Susan, did you come away with a sense of what you think he'll do about 2024? You know, it's interesting. Peter and I uh, visited and interviewed Trump twice in Mar-a-Lago for this book. And initially, I think we would say that we were somewhat skeptical uh, that he would, uh, you know, that he seemed sort of like a, a very unwilling retiree, but a, a retiree to Florida nonetheless. Uh, you know, but I think in particular, as we've seen these metastasizing investigations of Donald Trump uh, continue and escalate in the last few months, uh, not only the classified documents uh, investigation, the January 6th uh, congressional investigation, but also the grand jury investigation, the New York state investigations. There, It seems that Trump has a sense that actually being a candidate for president might protect him in some way. I also think that Donald Trump uh, as we all know by now, uh, cannot relinquish the stage. And I think that the mere concept that the sort of Trumpists, the Trump mini-minis, if you will, who've sprung up in the Republican Party, people like Ron DeSantis, the idea that Trump is just going to, like, fade away gracefully and let them uh, take over seems very unlikely to me, knowing what we know of Donald Trump's personality. Well, there is so much uh, to read, to reflect mm -hmm. on. Uh, in this book, The Divider, uh, uh, the White House, Trump in the White House 2017 uh, to 2021, it's, uh, it's just full of information that, uh, that Americans should, should know, frankly. Peter Baker, Susan Glasser, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy.